Daniel, all right. This morning's online did not work, if you didn't know. And I knew, well, I didn't know until afterwards, but about halfway through my sermon, everyone just stopped moving back there. I thought they had it fixed, but it was more like throw the papers in the air, and who cares, we'll get it next time. So for those who are online with us right now, we're sorry about that this morning, and uh, it's forever lost because we didn't record it either, so... Uh, that's the way it goes. It's just like pre-pandemic. <laughs> okay. So at any rate, we're so glad that you're here with us uh, this afternoon. And uh, it's a little warm, isn't it? Yeah, it's summertime. It's a little warm, but that, not that high humidity. So I'm thankful for that. And I'm sure I'm glad to see each and every one of you who are here in person and those joining us online. Thank you so much. We're going to sing first. Uh, 620. Well, it's not, you don't have a hymn book. It's going to be up there. Wonderful Jesus Medley.
so much to be thankful for. Uh, and uh, sometimes just to stop and think about it, I'm not going to ask anyone to stand up or anything like that, but just think in your own heart right now, I'm going to pray a moment, uh, something you need to be thankful for. The Lord has blessed us uh, beyond what we deserve, and uh, sometimes we get caught up in this world and its materialistic thought patterns and things and think we deserve more, but we're blessed beyond measure. We really are. We're really blessed. And uh, having the right perspective really helps us have the right attitude and one that's gracious and one that's totally different than the world's. And then again, helps us to be different from the world and uh, be a better testimony and witness for the Lord. And I'm going to pray now, but I do want to mention as we get ready to pray, I, I would encourage you to be in prayer about our country. Uh, today, Prime Minister uh, put us into election mode and uh, we need to be in prayer. Uh, we need to be in pray for, uh, praying for our country. And, uh, hey, serving your country uh, in that manner is, can, you know, we need to commend them and say that's great that you're willing to serve that way, uh, but we need to be wise as we vote and things of that nature and to be praying for them. They need Jesus Christ. They need him as their Savior. Uh, and our country is in desperate need of leadership, and we need to be in prayer about it. So let's look to a Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for... Another opportunity we have to get together, to gather uh, to, in your house, and thank for those who are here and those who are watching online. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have the right kind of attitude that pleases you, that, that lifts you up, and Lord, helps us distinguish us from the world. Uh, we are not like them. We are not to be like them. And Lord, help us to give you thanks for salvation, for our church family, for our own families, for work, for health, whatever it is in each and every one of our lives. Uh, you have been good. You continue to be good to us. And Lord, we pray for our country. And Lord, as today we were, we're told that there's an election in September, uh, Lord, I pray that we would pray for our country fervently. I hope we already have been. And Lord, for those who are running, and I believe the vast majority desire to serve, Lord, we're thankful for that spirit, that attitude. And Lord, we certainly do need godly leadership in our land. And Lord, we look to you to move amongst the hearts of men and Lord, to lead our country the right way. We need men who will follow you. And Lord, we need you at this hour in our country. And Lord, I pray you bless this time now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Take your Bibles and turn over to Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation chapter number 14. And uh, we're going to look at verses 1 to 5. I, I had a great conversation this morning with uh, Amanda Millington about the service last week when we looked at the, um, the Antichrist and the false, uh, uh, the false beast and the number and things. And she had brought up a great point that, you know, Satan doesn't know when the rapture and then the tribulation begins. Only one person knows that. Does anybody know who that is? Someone? Anyone? Does anyone know? Who knows when Jesus will rapture the church? I thought I heard the Father. The Father is the only one who knows. So the conversation was around, and she had a very good point, is that there's always been someone, because the devil doesn't know, but always someone that he's ready to energize to be that Antichrist. I mentioned a number of wicked men last time. And, uh, you know, we were talking about it, and it's true. Adolf Hitler could have been it. He could have been. He wasn't, but he could have been. But the idea that uh, Satan is, uh, he's always on the prowl. He's always on the move. He's looking, uh, he's looking somehow to, to defeat God. And uh, we need to remember that that's who uh, we face as well uh, in our world today. All right, so that's just a little preamble. All right, uh, Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, <clears throat> as the voice of many waters, and a voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new psalm before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song for, but the 140 and 4,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they were virgins. The, these are they which followed the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. 
these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. Let's pray as we start. Dear Jesus, I pray, Lord, you encourage us with this message. Help us to understand it. And Lord, as you have a great plan for the future, to understand how your plan is unfolding. And Lord, you are in control, and we're so thankful for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The last two chapters we've looked at in our study have been very dark, very unsettling. We talked about the Antichrist and the, the false prophet. Actually, you know, just in the last general while, we've been looking at that. And we talked about that being, along with Satan, being the unholy trinity. As so we see that Satan replicated what he's seen with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We, we witnessed the depravity, the, the depths of depravity of man as they abandon worship of the Creator and worship the devil through his false Christ and took the mark of the beast and so forth. Now the scene changes. The scene in chapter 13 where we left, that was earth. Okay, now in chapter 14, uh, for us who might have been uh, involved with uh, the arts in the theater, the scene changed, right? This was what? This was here on earth, chapter 13. Now we're in heaven, so a different place altogether. And in this passage, we, we see heavenly scene, okay? We see the Lamb of God, and He is the theme of the book, the Lamb of God, okay? And uh, who is the 144 witnesses? Anybody know? Jews, that's right, Jewish men. And 12 from how many different tribes? 12 times 12 is 144,000, you know, so 12,000, yep. Yeah. Uh, so that's where they come from. That's who they are. They've been selected. They were sealed as we studied back in chapter 7. That seemed like a long time ago. I was going to say eternity, but that's not a very good difference. A long time ago. And they preached the gospel. They came to earth, or they were on earth, and they preached the gospel here to those on earth during the darkest days of the tribulation. They have been always opposed uh, to the Antichrist, and they were preserved by God. And at some point, and it's not the first half of the tribulation, this is into the, the second half, what's referred as the Great Tribulation. At some point in the Great Tribulation, they have served their purpose. I've read commentators, some say oh, they were just brought to heaven. I think the greater situation is probably they're killed. Uh, but at any rate, where we see them is in heaven. They're in heaven, and these men join with the Lamb of God, and they gave Him the glory. So we're going to investigate this a little bit here. They weathered a very terrible storm here on earth. Uh, I remember, I think I've told you the story about how uh, one time me and my family were living in Newfoundland. We were going back on the ferry, and uh, we were, the ferry is supposed to be six to seven hours. We were on that thing for 12, doing this and this. It was horrible. I still have nightmares about it. And we, we got off that boat, and we were like drunk people, just, just hanging on. I could hardly drive to the motel because I couldn't even drive home. But we weathered the storm. You know, the boat made it through, and we were so glad it did. And these men, they, they've been through a storm beyond any storm, and now they're home uh, with the Lamb. Uh, they, they, are, they were protected by God, verse 1. They, they're there with the Lord. Uh, and when we first met these men back in chapter 7, in verse number 3, it says, uh, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So these men were sealed by God for a specific purpose. He protected them. Hundreds of millions of Perhaps even billions of people have died since that time. They have seen some really horrible things, some really bad, bad things. And they've been protected. Uh, the earth had been stained with the blood of the martyrs. They had seen it, and Satan will hunt them and harass them because, you know, they, they are preaching the gospel. He doesn't want that, and he can't do anything until God says it's okay. Uh, so they're preserved by God. These men arrive at Mount Zion. We see S used. This is referring uh, to Israel, Jerusalem, I should say, uh, or sorry, not Jerusalem, but Mount Zion in heaven. I'm getting ahead of myself. 
uh, they were, the 144,000 are there. There's not one missing. There's not 143,999. Nobody's missing. Has everyone ever felt or been there where you have been missed in a roll call or the bus has left without you? You know, how horrible a feeling. Uh, just um, a couple of weeks ago, the last two weeks, my folks were up. And there was one day we were eating and we were chatting and we forgot to call out the boys to come eat. We missed them. Now, they still got something to eat, but we missed them. All right? They didn't show up. So the idea here is that God perfectly preserves them, sealed on the day of redemption. And that's us as Christians today. We're sealed. We don't have to worry about being missed. You know, you're, the rapture is called. The Lord blows the, blows the trumpet. He's not going to miss you. You're going to go. Praise the Lord. Like, I'm down with it right now. To happen right now. Lord, call us home. Blow that trumpet. I'm, 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 I'm all for it. But no one's going to be left behind. Everyone's going to be there who knows Christ as Savior. Not one single person will be missed. We gather around that marriage supper of the Lamb. We're, we're not going to be saying, oh, there's a few seats empty. Where is Joe? Where is Sue? Or where? No, we're all there. Amen? All of us who know Christ as Savior, God will bring all his children home. Um, Mount Zion there, it's, it's an ancient name for the city of Jerusalem, but this is not in the Jerusalem, like we're thinking in, over in Israel. Some commentators think that this is taking place during the millennium. I, I honestly believe because all the things we just read uh, about the beast there, uh, the elders there, they, these are all symbols of heaven. This will take place in heaven. And they fulfilled their mission. They're in the presence of the Almighty. Uh, the, when men... When the world has gone mad and totally out of whack, they are taken in the presence of God. And, and hey, is there no other better place than home? And heaven is our home for eternity. Now, some of us probably haven't traveled much recently, gone very far with everything that's going on in our world. But you know, just the thought of when you come home from a long journey, uh, you come home and you get through your door of your house and you sit on your favorite chair and you're like, ah, oh, I'm home. There's comfort there. There's peace there. You know, it's just nice to be home. And heaven is our home, folks. If we know Christ as Savior, that we haven't been there yet, but when we get there, we'll have that same feeling of, ah, oh, I'm home. It's our home and something to look forward to. John 14, 1 to 3 talks a little bit about it. And in Revelation chapter 21, 22, which we'll get to in the Lord willing in the weeks ahead, talks a lot more about it. And I have spent, if I, if I kept track of all the hours I've thought about heaven, uh, you know, I would have impressive amount of time put in on it. Uh, it it's an amazing place to think about. And it's not like it's a, you go just go to your happy place. You know, some people who get daydreaming all the time. This is not a daydream. This is a reality that one day, because I know Christ is my Lord and Savior, I'll walk down those streets of gold. I'll see its glory. I'll hear the sweet songs of Zion sung. I'll join in too. You know, it's, it's going to be an amazing place. And we'll enter uh, thou into the joy of the Lord. That's what the Savior will say. One day we're going to be home, and that's something we should be excited about. Now, these 144,000 men are there, and this is still a future event. This hasn't transpired yet, uh, but they'll be there. Um, we see in verse 2 that uh, I heard a voice from heaven as a voice of many waters, as a voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of the harpers harping with their harps as they sung it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These men have been rescued from the terrors of tribulation. They've witnessed death, uh, destruction, um, unprecedented levels. Uh, we have looked at a number of things. Judgments have already taken place. And it's a horrific amount of destruction. And they have watched the world turn their back on God. Uh, they, had, they have seen the world fall at their feet to worship Antichrist. They seem horrible things done, more, they, horrible things that more than you probably could imagine. And don't, you don't want to imagine horrible things, but more horrible than what we can imagine. Now they're home. And now they praise the Lord. Just like when you get home 
You're like, oh, I'm so glad to be home. Oh, I can take off my shoes or whatever it is and just relax. It's so good to be home and things of that nature. When we get to heaven, we'll rejoice. We'll praise the Lord as well. And the contrast that these men see in, in, in just so quick fashion, you know, the world is filled with pain and sorrow and tears. There'll be lots of tears. I mean, there's tears now, but there's going to be so much more then. And then they're in heaven where there is none. Uh, this world is marred with disease and death. Over there, those things can't even be found in heaven. Isn't that a marvelous thing? You know, that's one thing I have thought about often because I've had so many family members or uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord who die of different diseases. Those things will never be found in heaven. They're never there. They're never allowed. And uh, this world is in the grip of sin and Satan and so much the more during the tribulation. Well, both those things are banned in heaven. They don't, they're not allowed entrance into heaven. This world is perishing, but the world that we'll go to as, as Christians endures for eternity. One day we'll take our last steps in this wicked world and we'll leave here and we'll fly away with him if we don't pass away before. But the reality is that's, if we know Christ as Savior, that is where we're headed. They're, they have a new song. It's talked about there in verse number three. And the 144,000 are overcome with joy uh, because they're in the presence of the Lord. They're overwhelmed and they burst forth with song. They burst forth with song, and they start to sing. And they sing a song that's unique to them. It's a new song, and no one's qualified to sing this song but them. And the word learn means to understand. No one can understand their song because no one else has lived their experience. I mean, so let's say they, they minister on earth for four years of the seven, for example. They have seen incredible destruction. They've witnessed horrific things. And at the same time, they've been preaching the gospel and people have gotten saved. So they probably have uh, memories of people who've turned to Christ. And maybe those same people turned to Christ who've been martyred then because they turned to Christ. You know, a new song is mentioned uh, seven times in the Old Testament. It's always used as a means to praise the Lord for something great, something amazing he's done. Psalm 98 one says, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and, and holy arm have gotten him the victory. So these, these men, we see some things about them, verses 4 and 5. They're a special group. And we saw some of these things, or mentioned some of these things back in chapter 7. Uh, they represent the choicest of God's servants down through the ages. You know, there have been many men and women who have taken the mark of God in the sense of serving the Lord and doing right, right, what's right, and these 144,000s are right up there with those. So the next two kind of describe them and their dedication. Verse 4, and these were they that were not defiled with women, for they were virgins. So there were, there's purity here. They maintained physical purity. They had not fallen prey to the sins of the flesh that will mark the last days. And beyond that, I believe there's a two-edged uh, application here. Beyond that, I, they're not succumbed to spiritual fornication. Okay, they, that will run rampant in the world. And I've, as I mentioned before, sometimes we don't think much of religion taking place uh, during the tribulation. There's lots of religion happening. But they will not succumb to uh, you know, holding hands with those who serve uh, Satan. They will only serve God. Uh, and they're going to serve the Lord as best they can. And they will be separate. And they will be holy, really, in the apostate age, right? I mean, there's no greater apostate age than the tribulation time. And God expects us today, as Christians, to walk the same way. He commands us to stay separate from the world. Uh, in Jude, verse 23, it says, even the garment spotted by the flesh. Christians, those Christians hated that, just their garment spotted by the flesh. So the idea that we, we should strive for that spotlessness as well in our lives. They were surrendered. They were surrendered. Uh, they, these are they which follow the Lamb, whethersoever he goeth. The, the 144,000 preachers had followed the Lord wherever, wherever he led them. Wherever he led them. They did not turn their back um, through by, because they were afraid. Have you ever done something that you're really afraid of? 
something came up and you know, I have to do this. If I don't do this, this is, I'm, I'm gonna have to do it later, so I just might as well face my fears right now. <clears throat> and you're so afraid. And sometimes we don't do it <laughs> because the fear takes a hold of us. We're like, no, I can't, I'll, I'll do it later. I'll, I know it's gonna come back, I'll do it later. These men, they followed the Lord, even though they were afraid. They're, they're no different than us, they have emotions. They didn't turn away from the task, even though it was dangerous. Uh, dangerous. Uh, I know I've, I've helped people do things. I'm not really good with ladders. As I mentioned this morning, I'm not a real handyman. So I, if I go up a ladder, something bad's going to happen. So I just stay off ladders. I mean, uh, these banners, that's Pastor Mac going up these ladders. I'm very happy to put up these banners. I'm very happy to hold on the ladder. I'll, I'll do everything to keep the ladder up. But I'm not going up. I go up those ladders, and it's like this the whole way. I shake the whole ladder. Uh, so, you know, that, that's not really that dangerous. If I fall, it's dangerous. But at any rate, these men follow the Lord through dangerous times. Dangerous. They stayed the course. They follow the Lamb. And the word follow means to be in the same way as. These men walked in the ways of the Lord. They made His way their way. And then they stayed the course for the glory of God. And, you know, God expects that from us, too. The 144,000 are not the only ones God expects us to, to follow Him. He saved us, as we talked about this morning, as the body of Christ and things, to serve and to follow. He wants us to be surrendered as well. He wants us to make His way our way uh, and, and to follow the course. The Lord wants us to follow Him wherever He leads with uh, no regrets, no refusals, and no reservations. You know, just, just go. He's looking for those obedient servants. A while ago, um, I guess that was back, the sp maybe the winter, I can't really remember. Maybe it was, yeah, it was March. In March, I did a series on Wednesday night about showing the, how the missions had gone through the world. I used that big map. I don't know how many of you can remember that. I did that on Wednesday nights. And uh, I talked about different missionaries and things. And I mentioned one guy. His name was William Borden. And he was born into a really wealthy family as an heir to a, a Borden dairy fortune. Like, this guy had some serious money behind him. And he soon recognized the truth wealth was to be found in a different inheritance, and that being a child of God. He, and he lived a short life. He did not live long, but he made a real, real impact. Uh, he graduated high school. He was a smart young fella. He graduated when he was 16 from high school. And he decided to become a missionary. He had done some traveling with his family. He understood the need, the global need for Christ. Uh, he had traveled through Asia, Middle East, and in parts of Europe. He, uh, he, he wrote in his Bible a decision of no reserves. He wrote that in the back of his Bible. He uh, went off to Yale University and he was kind of credited with revolutionizing the campus by starting a weekly prayer meeting and Bible study that was attended by three quarters of the student population. That's pretty amazing. You know, he's just still a young man. He's still a young man, and he got, he got really excited about serving the Lord. Uh, he could have started, he could have got involved in any career he wanted, and people would have had him, any corporation desired him. Rather, he stood firm in his decision to become a missionary, and then he went to seminary. And once again, he made record of his decision, and he said, no retreats this time, in the back of his Bible. After finishing seminary, Borden then studied, uh, went to Egypt to study uh, Arabic language and the writing of it. And uh, he was planning on reaching Muslims in China. That was his plan. But he died in Egypt from spinal meningitis not long after getting there. And though he never reached the people that he intended to go to, he made an impact on people around, his, around him at that time. And the last century in his Bible was no regrets. No regrets. God wants all his people, all his children, to live lives with, that make a great impact. And you don't have to go off to university or go halfway around the world to make a great impact. You can be whoever you are right now and make an impact for Jesus Christ. 
And God has uh, different things for all of us, like in the sense of uh, way of life, in the sense of jobs and our family situations. But He just wants us to make an impact for Him. And He, you know, we definitely see no reserves in Romans 12, 1, you know, just being willing to sacrifice. Allow Him to use us as He desires, where He wants. No retreats, totally surrendered. Philippians 3, 14, wherever God wants us, totally surrendered. Uh, face the distractions. God will help us face that and the discouragements and just follow Him. Stay focused. And no regrets, and that's uh, finish the course in 2 Timothy 4, 7. You know, Paul is writing to Timothy. His life is almost done. He's finished the course, kept the faith. You know, we do need to be doing that and uh, following the Lord with every bit that we have. Uh, these men, there's some, uh, these 144 that were chosen, saved and sealed at the beginning of the tribulation. They went out and preached the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, I'll be honest, there's times that ministry is tough. You're trying to help people. You know, you show them, hey, this is the gospel. This is what you need. And maybe someone mocks it, or maybe someone re totally rejects it, rejects that message. And it's not always, and it's occasionally, I have to be honest, there's occasion when they, they try to be offensive, they insult you for showing it to them. But sometimes, a lot more for me, it's uh, not that they insult me, it's just that they reject it, and you're like, this is serious. Don't, don't blow this off. I'm not just another salesman who's trying to get you to buy a vacuum or something. You know, this is really serious. This is life-changing. That's discouraging. And then uh, when you try to help uh, believers live the right way and things, and they reject, they, they don't go, what, you know, make the decisions they need to. So sometimes ministry is hard. But ministry with the 144,000 is going to be incredibly more difficult. They're not going to be able to say, let's uh, go over to such and such a Baptist church and have a big gathering and we'll, you know, they're going to be on the move all the time because Satan and his minions don't want them to be preaching the truth. You know, it's going to be tough, but they're going to do their best to impact those around them. And uh, we need to be going for it. And we don't, you know, we really don't know as we try to live for Jesus Christ, like these 144,000 men, they live for the Lord during that tribulation time period. They're impacting lives. Then they move on. They don't stay there and start a church. They're moving throughout the world. So they don't know the impact they're going to have, what, what's going to take place. And so with us, we don't know when we give out that track or when we witness to that atheist or whatever it might be. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, it's not till heaven that we'll see the impact of our lives for Jesus Christ. So if anything, that should encourage us to continue doing well for Christ. Because we don't know. That's not a reason to be discouraged and not do anything. It should be an encouragement to go forward and do something for the Lord, no matter what it is, and keep faithful until He calls us home. The latter, and verse number 5, And in their mouth was found no guile. They are there without fault uh, before, uh, where I lost it, uh, before the throne of God. These men stand in the presence of God complete. The Bible says there's no guile in them. So the word guile means no de like, like deceit. So there's no deceit in them. Uh, they're... And the idea here as well here is being a decoy. So being something, they're not, they're not being something they're not. They're, they're being genuine. Who doesn't like someone who's genuine? I mean, even if that person is, is bumble fumbles all over the place, but that's who they are, you appreciate that that's who they are. I'm going to be honest. I appreciate people being real so much more than someone who puts on a, a show. Be real. I mean, if you're real as kind of rude or you, know, you got an edge to you, that's fine. I can live with you. At least you're being real. These guys were being real. They were the real deals. And these men claimed to be servants of Almighty God, and the way they walk, the way they work, matched their talk. All right? They're not fakes. They were the real deal. The word fault means there in the latter part of verse 5, means blemish. These men had no flaws in their life. Now, they're still sinners, but there was nothing there that would, uh, you know, def deflect away from Jesus Christ. These men were declared, uh, you know, hey, Jesus Christ is it, and they weren't living a different life that would cause people to drift away from God or say, no, you're not real. And again, these, these, this is a word here for saints living in our day and age too, that we need to be the same type of people. We should live out uh, before men what we claim to be before God. 
He, uh, 1 John 2, 6, he that saith he abideth in me, on himself also so to walk even as he walked. So our daily walk should point people to Jesus Christ. Say, well, you are different. You act different. You speak different. Um, you, you just have something about you that I, don't, I can't understand but God. Isn't that? I've had that happen a couple times, and that's a really awesome moment for me to hear that, you know, you've got something I don't have, and I'm like, yeah, want me to tell you what that is? It's Jesus. That's, that's really awesome moments when that has happened. We should live our lives that are without blemish so that we can stand in his presence with confidence. Because one day we'll stand before the Lord. It's going to happen. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes with life, uh, we kind of drifts out of our mind, but we'll stand before him. 1 John 2, 28. And now little children abide in him, that when we shall appear or where he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. We all fall short. I mean, there's no one perfect. I understand that. And there is a day when this flesh will uh, drop away forever and we'll stand perfect with all fault in his presence. And what a day that will be. And I look forward to it. And uh, just, to, just to think that we have these days to serve Jesus Christ. I understand around us, we see our world... Uh, it's, it's horrible, the wickedness we see and the, the wicked things that, that men are trying to promote and do and the morality is falling down all around us. I mean, we could go on and on and leave really depressed. But let me encourage you that we still can be a light today for Jesus Christ. To show others that we live different because of Jesus. That's right. That's why we live different. It's Jesus. It has nothing to do with anybody else but him. And uh, I'm so thankful that I do not have to live through the tribulation. As we've gone through it, I mean, it's been horrible. It's horrific. I'm so thankful that I will be in heaven. Uh, and I'm thankful that others around us are serving Jesus Christ. And that I'm thankful for the 144,000 that are going to preach Christ throughout this world. You know, and, and I hope uh, that your desire is to live for Christ today and tomorrow and as far as long as as the Lord gives you life here on this earth, that you will serve him with that same kind of energy and enthusiasm that we see in the 144,000. So I hope that's a help to you. Understand that just a little bit better. If you have any questions about that, if you have any thoughts, please do let me know. I really do appreciate this morning uh, Amanda talking to me about it because, uh, hey, that's a good point. And, hey, aren't we all on the journey exploring the Word? It's a really good thing to talk about. You know, if uh, you, something you found, some nugget, hey, it could be a real great encouragement to someone else. So don't hide what you find. You know, uh, tell others about it, all right? Uh, so, and my desire is that you would have that same heart to, to explore the Word. So this week uh, for uh, us, Tuesday uh, podcast, a survey of Song of Solomon. Uh, on Thursday, a challenge, uh, and we're going to look uh, at creation and the, the Thursday challenge on our Facebook page. And then Saturday morning, 8.30, Pastor Matt's going to be bringing us something. Uh, this week, too, uh, we start Faith Bible Institute, and that's all from home. There's not coming here. You can do it all from home. But if you are interested, you still have time to sign up. You can still get in, uh, and it's a great course. I think we just got around 20 people signed up this semester, uh, so there's still... There's endless amount of room to sign up. It's all online, and I know it will be an encouragement to you. So if you'd like to, see me after the service. And then next Sunday, Pastor Thiessen and his family are going to be here with us. He's going to be preaching for us all day, so we look forward to that. And uh, a little bit of reuniting with some folks that we certainly do love and care about. Uh, so I hope that you can be here for that. All right, folks, uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Jesus, thank you uh, for the opportunity we've had to look in your word this evening. Help us to strive to be the witnesses, the testimonies that you want us to be in, in this wicked time. And Lord, thank you for your word. Help us to be exploring it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You're dismissed.